Hey, my name is Casey, and I get to serve as one of the pastors here, and we are super excited to begin a new series, uh, and it's going to be out of the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Nehemiah is an Old Testament guy in the book, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but, but I love the name of this series. It's called Revive, Bringing Beautiful Things to Life. Revive. It's not a word that I use a lot. You've heard the word revival, but revive is not necessarily a word that's probably in, in most of your uh, vocabularies. It's not in mine. But as I hear and I think about it, it's absolutely what God loves to do. And so we're going to talk about this for like five weeks, man. We're just going to be in it, walking through the book of Nehemiah and seeing how God brought beautiful things to life through the leadership of Nehemiah and his people and how he's still doing that today. So welcome, invite your friends, online community, hello, welcome to you guys. We'd love for you guys to continue to join us uh, through, this, through this book. So if you have a Bible, that's awesome. You'll want to turn to Nehemiah. Um, if not, I'm going to be reading a little bit out of Nehemiah to orient you to the book. But a lot of what we're going to do today is me um, taking out a, a particular portion of it and helping you to see it in the context of a journey. A journey. So, a couple of things. Um, you have a, you have an outline there that gives you kind of an overview of what's going on with Nehemiah, and then also an overview of, of some of the messages to come. And um, there there are a few good things to know before we kind of kick off in this series. First of all, who is Nehemiah? Like, why why are we talking about this guy? What was the setting of his book? And and kind of like, why is he important to what we're looking at today? First of all, um, Nehemiah. He was uh, he was what what you would call a, an important official in his world. He was a guy with some clout. He had achieved something, um, but he was in a place that was not his home. He was like in exile, doing well, but not in his hometown. The book of Nehemiah and all that history, give you a little context for that. It takes place a thousand years after Moses. So even if you're new to like the whole church thing, you've heard of, probably heard of Moses and that whole situation. So think Moses, Red Sea, Charlton Heston, if you're like old enough to remember that. If not, Prince of Egypt, something like that, or whatever. So Moses, and then go a thousand years and then you're going to come to like the Nehemiah time frame. Go 400 years after Nehemiah, and you're going to see Jesus on the scene. So that's just kind of orienting you to history. Now, Nehemiah and his people were not in a good space. Have you ever been like, um, it's, it's not a horrible day, you're just off. You're just, you're just out of your, your normal routine. You're not fully yourself. You're having to function, but you're just not fully yourself. You're, you're like a bit off. Well, Nehemiah and his people, they, they, were, they were really off. They had been taken captive. So back in the day, um, it wasn't nuclear bombs. What would happen is a group of people, specifically like the Babylonians, came in, and what they would do is they would conquer your area, and then they would bring a ton of you back to their area. And just like you heard Tom share about indentured servants and things like that, they would then put you to work. And some of you might get decent jobs, and others of you would just kind of be servants. But you would be under the captivity of another people. So the people of Israel, the, the God's people who were living in Jerusalem in that area, they get exiled over here to Babylon. And they're under a different rule. They're in captivity over here in Babylon. Now, good things are happening in Babylon, but they're not home. They're not at, in, their, in their center base where, where, you know, like God is doing this really special work of making his name famous and Again, good things are happening over here, but Jerusalem is like the heart of, of where God's people uh, want to be. And so Nehemiah gets word that um, the city of Jerusalem, everybody had kind of known this, but there was this guy before Nehemiah named Ezra who went back to start some rebuilding. He was going to do a, like a, a rebuild project, and, and he was rebuilding the temple and things like that. But the problem was Nehemiah got some information that was really disturbing. The information that Nehemiah got was that the walls had been broken down and they weren't built back up. That was a really big deal because even though the temple was going up, and even though this guy Ezra had gone there 15 years before Nehemiah, it was still a place that was um, unprotected. And as I'm going to read to you in just a second, they lived in shame because it was like they had a temple and they, they had the beginnings of like what God was doing, but, but they were super vulnerable. 
there, there was no defense. So they couldn't really flourish as God's people. They were just kind of surviving. Um, I was reading this commentary on Nehemiah by uh, David Guzik, and he's one of my favorite guys on, on commentaries. And when he, he made this point, which I thought was really cool. He's like, um, sometimes in your Christian life, it's about survival. You're like, survive. But the whole of your Christian life, like, like God wants you to do more than just get by. God wants you to do more than just grind it out to the next day. God's people are supposed to live with abounding joy and hope. The word flourishing should accompany your life. And that doesn't mean that you, there's not going to be difficult seasons. That doesn't mean there's not going to be trying times. But if you belong to what God's doing, then you should be able to begin to flourish even in the most difficult of situations. Jerusalem couldn't do that because their walls were down. They were unprotected and any enemy could come in at any point. That's where we pick up uh, the, the story of Nehemiah. Hopefully that sets a little context for you. And today we're going to look at a specific journey of how Nehemiah was in a distant place, but he walked forward as a disciple. Verse 1 of Nehemiah says this, the, word, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakali. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. So he's like, hey, how's it going back home? What's going on back, you know, back in Jerusalem? And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived, again, that, that word survival, who survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. Great trouble and shame. If you have ever experienced great trouble or shame, you are in a really good place today. You're in an awesome place because you're in the same place where God's people were, and we're believing that God, as he did for his people back then, wants to continue to bring about that reviving spirit today. God's pretty consistent in that. The remnant there lives in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. All right, what we're going to do now with the remainder of our time is just kind of walk our way through chapters 1 and 2 and highlight some of the journey that, that happens specifically for Nehemiah as he goes from being in a distant land to being very near to what the heart of God was doing. My suggestion to you is this. You have the outline with you. You have the, you have the notes with you. You're, it's all going to be there in the, in the outline. You're going to be able to kind of like circle certain aspects of it where you might find yourself. Because what we're understanding more and more about discipleship is that it is not just an event. It's more of a journey. It is a, it is a journeying from one place spiritually to another. Now, that could also include physically and emotionally and mentally as well. But I love this idea of journey. So we're going to take a look at the journey of Nehemiah. And I'm going to ask you to kind of chart your own journey. Where do you think you are on that journey if you're a follower of Christ? And if you're not a follower of Christ, I think you'll still be able to relate to some of the things that happen on this journey. And I would ask that you chart kind of like where you are in your own journey. And then we're going to finish by seeing how we might be able to join God in reviving people from distant to disciple. Let's ask the Father to help us in that. Father, as we look into your word, we ask that the power of your word combined with the power of your Holy Spirit would bring life and hope into dark spaces. We love you, Father. We need you and we expect you this morning in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So the journey of disciples from distant to disciple. Let's take a look at what happens along the way in this journey. For, for now, now listen, Nehemiah, he was, he was a disciple, if you will. He, was, he loved God, and you can see that very clearly in the way that he responds. But, but there's a certain journey, even for those of us who love God, at becoming even more fully committed disciples. And, and so that's kind of what we're going to see here on his journey. Look, look with me in verse 3 of chapter 1. Um, the, the first sort of stop on his journey is he becomes disturbed by a new truth. Verse 3 says, And they said to me, There are some friends, there are some, 
there's some people who know what's going on over here in Jerusalem, and they come back and they bring some bad news to Nehemiah. And that news doesn't fall on deaf ears. It actually disturbs him. And uh, in the rest of chapter 1, he mourns, and we'll take a look at this, and he prays, and it, like, it like breaks him up. Understand something. That early in your discipleship journey, and I just would, so for some of you who haven't begun a discipleship journey, I'm just going to tell you what's to come. Early in your discipleship journey, one of the first aspects to you actually becoming a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ, is you start to get disturbed by some like new news. You start to get disturbed by some new information. I mean, that's usually when we're sick, how we get better, right? We take our temperature, we look and we're like, oh, 103. That's bad news. It's disturbing. I now should probably do something about that. That's how people get better as they face their addictions. They come to this place and they, they have some disturbing news, oftentimes told to them by an outside source like, bro, your life is unmanageable and out of control. You need to do something. And if they're not ready to hear it, then they continue in their chaos. But if they are ready to hear it, they get disturbed and then they start on this new journey of health and life. This same is true for Christians. Until you become disturbed with the reality of the condition of our soul, of our heart, we won't begin this journey of discipleship. The disturbing news about me, I, don't, I know some of you just met me for the first time. You know, like I said, I'm Casey, one of them. But, but you should know that my heart is wicked. There's wickedness that's bent up in my heart that I, I inherited as I was born in Cleveland back in 1974. I, mean, I, just, I just leaned right into that wickedness. It pervaded my soul and it was a cancer and it separated me from God. Like I, God and I were not on good terms. I, I kind of thought I was because I went to church and I actually had perfect, this is totally random fact about me, but did you know from kindergarten to like eighth grade, I won the perfect attendance award in school? No <laughs> lie, like that, I'm not even playing. Like I had like the certificates are somewhere. Perfect, that's, that's pretty crazy. Either I'm super healthy or my parents are kind of mean. One way or the other. Like I won those awards. But listen, that doesn't mean anything. All the stuff that I did, all, this, all, the, all the, the sort of achievements that I had, I was still in a bad place with, with like God Almighty because my heart, there was wickedness and selfishness bent up in my heart. It's just who I was naturally. It disturbed me. It disturbed me and I didn't necessarily know what to do with it until I started to hear like some good news that spoke right into it, that even though God and I are not, we're not, on, we're not really on speaking terms, like I'm actually, the scriptures would say I'm an enemy of a holy God because of my unrighteousness. But that holy God is also a loving God who pursues me in my unrighteousness. Once I was disturbed enough by the bad news, like I started looking for some good news and I heard about this Jesus who was like, yo, I know the depravity of your heart. I know the depths even beyond what you can recognize and I still want you. And I want to give you my righteousness, and I want to trade your filth for my cleanliness. I want to trade your shame for my right standing with the Father. And the way he did that was he went to a cross and took my sin, was crushed in my place. He was resurrected. He overcame my sin and my death, and he offered me good news that spoke right into the disturbing news of my sinful condition. And he's like, listen, here's what you, forget your perfect attendance. Forget your church attendance. Forget this, forget that, forget all these good things that you think like measure up to something. You just need to quit on yourself and say yes to me. By faith, come follow me. Come receive what I have for you. That wouldn't make any sense had I not been disturbed by some pretty bad news. That's why our discipleship journeys usually begin in that sort of fashion. Verse 4, but we don't stay there. We don't stay. Listen, we don't stay in the bad news because although there was wickedness bent up in my heart and my, start, my heart is still not made perfect yet, like there's, a, there's more good news happening now for those who follow Jesus than certainly bad news. Look where the journey goes. Verse 4, Nehemiah is changed by a new heart. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept. Nehemiah, like, um, th th there, was a, there was a change in heart for Nehemiah. He went from being comfortable and stationary in the city where he was to saying, like, man, this isn't only disturbing, but, like, like it, was, it was as if his heart changed from, from being comfortable and content over here to being like, man, I, there's, there's got to be something to be done about this. Nehemiah began to experience 
like a new heart of sorts. And for those of you who um, are, are following Jesus, there was a time when you were disturbed by the bad news, but, but it probably fell on deaf ears for years until one day you're like, oh, you mean me. Like, I've got a problem with God. Oh, like, you mean me. Like, like I need a savior. And when you came to that realization of, oh, you mean me, that was just um, evidence that God had, had placed a new heart within you to receive new things. Step two on the journey is that, is that there's, there's like a new heart involved in your journey. And these aren't always in order, okay? But you can't understand disturbing news or good news unless God gives you a heart to understand it. Verse five, you see that Nehemiah here is, is like captured by a new love. He says this, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. One of the early signs that you're on the discipleship journey from distant to like near to God is that, is that you, start to, you start to have a focus. You start to be captured by a new love. Like Nehemiah, he's over here. He's doing his job. Everything's, everything's you know, happening. He's comfortable. He's, he's being efficient. There's nothing wrong with what he's doing. He gets the disturbing news. He, he kind of has a new heart about it. And then he starts getting captured by this new love. So it's not just as, as though Christians are like really disturbed about their sin and then they stay there. There's a, disturb, there's a disturbance about the condition of our soul. But then we start getting captured by this God who loves us right in the midst of who we are. Nehemiah was captured by the steadfast, which means one way, unrelenting, like radical love of God. He started getting captured by a new love. Listen, early in your Christian walk, here's what's going to happen to you. If you're not a Christian, this is, I, I, I like tell, I tell people what's going to happen. I'm, I'm, this is a big spoiler alert right here. If you're not a believer and you're like, no, Jesus, I'm just here, you know, because you promised me lunch, whatever. Whatever you're here, it's totally cool. You're welcome. But here's what's going to happen to you. One day, you're going to hear this news, it's going to break your heart. But you're not going to stay broken because you're going to start to hear about a God who is radically in love. Not just love, in love. Passionately with you. And that's going to start to capture you more than other things in life used to capture you. You're still going to go to work. It's just not going to be number one anymore. You're still going to raise your kids. You're just not going to idolize them anymore. You're still going to be in relationships. They're just not going to be your world anymore. You're actually going to develop a new appetite for something even more satisfying than those good things. Well, where, where else does this journey lead? Verse 8, he begins to be informed by a new source. It says here that there was um, uh, like a, a, a remembering. Verse 8, remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses. So he's talking to God now. One of the things that Nehemiah does often is praise. And in this portion, he, he's saying, God, remember your word. Nehemiah, in this journey from distant to disciple, new heart, new, you know, disturbing news, all these things are happening early. But what also happens early in this journey is he starts to be informed by a new source. He's no longer informed by just the daily events of, of where he is in his captivity. He now re remembers the word of God, and the word of God starts to inform his decision making. So if you're early in your Christian walk, or you're helping somebody who's early in their Christian walk, one of the things that we should be prepared for is to help them to be informed by a new source. They used to go here to look for advice and information and help. Now we start to go to the Word of God, and the Word of God is radically different than probably most of the other blogs you've been looking at. Like Tim Keller says that the kingdom of God, it turns the world upside down. So early in your discipleship walk, you're gonna encounter how God views money, how he views sexuality, how he views um, uh, politics, how he views um, uh, power, how he views um, uh, the, the poor. You're gonna start to encounter all these things. You're like, that's what God thinks? That's what God and, and there's going to be some radical shifts that happen because you're starting to be informed by a new source. I want to, I want to encourage you. That's, it's good. Lean into that. You're about something different. You're on a journey. What happens next in, in, in Nehemiah's journey? Verse 8, he begins um, 
No, I'm sorry, verse 11. He begins to be motivated by a new mission. He says um, that he knows that God has chosen to make his name dwell there. Make his name dwell there. Nehemiah understands that God had something more for him than where he currently was. It was cool that Nehemiah had been disturbed by some bad news, that he had a new heart and he was being captured by a new love. But the deal is when those things happen to you on your journey, you can't stay in the same rhythms of life where God found you. You begin to be motivated by the mission of God, not just the message of God. The message of God is beautiful. It's the gospel message. It's like anyone can come at any time. God is like crazy rich in mercy. What do you want? I got it. Come, come, come back. I'm here. I'm ready. I'm available. That's a beautiful message of the gospel. But the reason you come back, the reason you drink deeply of the mercy of God is so that he might send you back out again, new and on mission. And this time, the center of your mission is not you. The center of your mission is him. And what God was doing back then is the same thing God is doing right now, rescuing and renewing all of humanity by a Messiah named Jesus, by this anointed one named Jesus. So, so Nehemiah is like, okay, that's where you're making your name famous. That's what you're doing. I'm going to go join you in what you're doing. Author Blackaby says, figure out what God's doing and join him. On your journey from distant to disciple, one of the things that's going to happen is you're going to start doing different things because what God is doing starts to matter to you. We go to chapter 2 and we, we begin to see sort of like the, the second half of his journey from distant to disciple. Look at verse 2. It said that he was scared by a new fear. In verse 2, this is nothing but sadness of the heart and I was very much afraid. Here's the deal. Nehemiah is a cupbearer, right? That's a really important job. That meant that you tasted the king's drink and oftentimes food. And if you died, check this out. The king didn't eat it. He was like, that must be bad. Okay? That, that's how, there was no smell test. There was no take a little like polite bite. I mean, people would kill each other through this. And so if you were a cupbearer, that was like a really honorable job. It meant that you got to hang around the king a lot. It meant that you were basically the one who prevented the king from dying by tasting his stuff. And every time you went in the presence of the king, what the, context, what the historical context said is that you needed to be happy because it, it, it meant that the king was so awesome that basically nobody could be in his presence without being happy. So if you were unhappy, you were taking a risk. Nehemiah goes in there and he knows he's gonna have like this long face. He knows he's gonna have a face that communicates something's not right. And so he's like scared about it. He knows what it means for his life. And he's afraid. So I just wanna like give you a heads up. You've been disturbed by bad news. You've been captured by a new love. You start to get informed by some new stuff. You start to hear about the mission of God that might be calling you into foster care, might be calling you over to Haiti for a short-term mission trip, might be calling you into foster parent night out, might be calling you to have kids, might be calling you to talk to your neighbor and share your story, might be calling you to leave your job and do this, might be calling you to stay at your job and do that. Here's the deal. The longer you hang out with the person and people of God, you're going to start doing some crazy stuff. I just got to tell you that. You're gonna start doing some crazy stuff. And when you get to the edge of doing crazy stuff, like fill in the blank, you're gonna get scared. I'm just here to tell you that's okay. Sometimes you need somebody who's been there just a little longer than you to say when you're scared, it's okay. You're not in a bad spot. Just keep going. Just keep going. Nehemiah was scared. It's gonna be part of the journey. Verse four says here that he was then empowered by a new person. So, so in, in chapter 2, Nehemiah gets scared. He's going to the king. He's going to ask the, the king to go back to, Jeru to Jerusalem to build up the walls. And he's kind of nervous about this mission that he's on. And so what does he do? Right before he asks, I love this. This is me all day. Some of you may think I'm like super weird, and that's totally cool, because I really am, but this is not weird. But you might think this is weird. He says this quick prayer. He's a quick prayer. He's like a shotgun prayer guy. You know, like he sees something and he does a quick shot on prayer. And but right before he goes to the king, it says that he prays, to, he says, praise to the Lord. And then he goes to the king. He's got like this constant dialogue with the Lord all day. 
And I love that because he begins to be empowered by a person other than himself. Along your discipleship journey, you will start to experience power you've never had before. I can guarantee it. Here's what's going to happen. You, you'll be at the beginning, and you'll be motivated by this new love. You'll be like, dude, Jesus, he loves me as I am. He wants to use me. Awesome. You'll start serving. You'll, and, and you'll find yourself kind of like still sort of depending on yourself to do what Jesus is asking you to do until he actually asks you to like jump and like leave Babylon and come get real over here. Like switch it up. And then you're going to be like, yo, I can't do that. And Jesus is going to be like, yo, you're right. And then you're going to have this really awesome, intimate dialogue where you're like, I love you, Jesus. I just can't go there. He's like, I know. I'm going to come with you. And then you're going to meet Jesus on the way. And you're going to experience power from a new person that you would never experience over there. God still loves you. God still wants you. God is still pleased with you over there in Christ. It's just that you're never going to experience what he was like over here. And then when you get here, then you're going to get crazy, crazy. You're going to be like, oh, Jesus, this is what's up. This is what it's like to live outside of my power. Like, I'm super, I want some more of this. I want some more of this. And then you're going to find yourself in far out crazy places surrounded by crazy people doing like things that you would have never thought were possible because it's not going to be you anymore. You would have kept you on that stage doing another Bible study and telling, telling your friends about what happened to you. That's really cool. That's, really, that's a great start. But you know, the Christian life is more than just about like what you believe in and what you tell. It's, it's like what you do. And you're going to find yourself in some blacked out places experiencing the power of a new person on this journey. If you haven't, it, it's cool. Look for it. If you're discipling somebody who's like, what, what Casey's talking about is foreign to me, it's totally cool. Be ready to invite them to it. Let's not be afraid to invite people to really difficult and strange things because we're believing that there's an awesome God who will meet them on the way. Well, there's a few more things that happen on this journey and then we'll bring it to some, just a, a, a close here and, and what that means for us. And so, you know, he, he meets this new person along the way and, and then he gets attacked by a new enemy in verse 10. There's some people that, that start coming up on him and um, they're like, you can't do this. You know, you're not going to do this. As a matter of fact, um, the, the series is based on this verse. Are they going to really revive the stones? Like, come on, dude. So not only are you going to be afraid when God gets you to the point of jumping, you're actually going to start to now have an enemy that comes and attacks you. I just want to tell you, it's okay. Strange things. Weird this, that, it's happening. I don't know, this never happened to me before, and now it's happened to me. It's okay, you now have an enemy who hates what you're doing. On this journey, that's normal. That's a natural part of the journey to becoming a disciple. Don't run away from it. Just surround yourself in a community that can help you to battle. A couple other things here. He becomes sensitive to a new voice. He, he, actually, um, he actually begins to... Um, it's like God puts something on his heart. And in chapter 2 it says God puts something on his heart and he, and he waits to tell the people. But the point I'm making here is that God will start speaking to you. The longer you follow him, the more you're on this journey, the more that you will become accustomed to hearing the voice of your father. Yes. Sensitive hearing comes along the way. So if, you're, if you get around people who are like, this is what the Lord told me here, this is what the Lord told me here, and you're like, yo, God just must not like me because he never talks to me. Just keep going. Just keep learning how to listen. Just keep getting around people who are helping you to develop that skill because it's part of the journey. And then finally, here, here's, here's where Nehemiah my ends. He, he, um, he becomes contagious for a better party. At the, at the end of chapter two, he's like, let's rebuild together. And it's not just about Nehemiah. It's about Nehemiah now bringing people with him. That's the journey. Now, now, it's not always like set, like this happens and this happens. But those are some things that you can expect along the way. And the reason I tell you that is, is that there's a couple of reasons. Number one is if you're discipling somebody, 
Like, we're really big into discipling people in this church, which means somebody who's a little bit walked with Jesus a little bit longer is helping somebody else to figure that out. You might know that as, like, sponsorship in another world. Same thing. Same thing. Just same thing. Walking along, helping them, guide them through the way. If, if you're the person who's doing the discipling, be prepared for these things to happen. Save this outline, and when they happen, and, and you're, the person that you're like working with gets scared, or they start to get like some crazy attacks, or, or they start to have a, an idea that's like kind of like dangerous in their mind, but you know it's good, just be prepared to encourage them to take the next step. If you're the person who's this, who is experiencing this, then part of me telling you all this is to normalize the journey that might freak you the heck out along the way. It's normal part of going from distant to disciple. But it's not just for Christians. This is also for non-believers. This is also for people who have yet to come to follow Jesus. They're also on a journey. And they're going to need the same thing that people in Christ are going to need. Jesus provides it. So this is kind of where we end. If we're going to join God in reviving people from distant to disciple, they're going to need two things. They're going to need proximity and they're going to need invitation. Proximity and invitation. You're going to need to be near to them and you're going to need to learn how to invite them to go be special. I was 20, early 20s, and I had like, I, there was no bald spot, it wasn't even receding that much, um, I was not, I, I was not as tired as I am, I was like, you know, I was like a young 20 year old, and I was married and all these sort of things, and uh, there was this guy, so here's my, here's the pattern of my life, God told me, I love you, now go be special, my family told me, I love you, now go be special, and then I met somebody, his name's Dan. And in my early 20s, he started to tell me, like, I love you, dude. Now go be special. And he invited me to come and help out with the youth group, which I didn't, I don't know if we really wanted to do it or not, but my wife and I did it. And then we started to develop a relationship with, with him and his wife and sort of things like that. And he began to be the person who discipled me. And there were two things that he did and continues to do to this day, as I'm talking about like even last Wednesday, he's kept me close and he's invited me to go be special. He's invited me to like, what's next? So we started volunteering with him. I started working with him in the school and my life was defined by like, I loved coaching. I loved all the things that I was doing, and I thought I was in a really good place. But he, as he tells the story, he's like, dude, you used to love two things, um, playing softball and People Magazine. Now, there's nothing wrong with either of this. But it's not a judgment zone. I'm not here to judge. You play softball, that's awesome. If you like People Magazine, do your thing. That's totally cool. But he's like, he looked at my life, and he's like, you're... I wasn't like in any kind of crazy radical sin. It was, the marriage was fine. I was, everything was, it wasn't like I was spiraling out of control. I just was kind of like in my battle, uncomfortable and content. And he loved me enough to say, it's like time for you to go be special. You should go take a class in seminary. And I went on that journey and that then led me working for a church. And, while I was at that church and continuing to meet with Dan, and he was continuing to keep me close and, and, and inviting me to go be special, the next thing that he invited me to was like coming to start this thing. I love you. Now go be special. It's like I was on that journey that I just described to you. I was afraid and I was trying new things and I was experiencing the power of God. But here's the deal. We get stuck on our journey unless there is somebody who not only stays close to us, but invites us to the next special thing. Amen. <clears throat> I love you. Now go be special. He continues to do that for me today in my marriage, with my kids, in this church. And my question to you today is we prepare ourselves to head to our communion table is who in your life are you close enough to to invite to go and be special 
Who's doing that for you? Who are you doing that for? That's how we walk together on this journey of going from distant to disciple. I'm going to ask our elders to come and we're going to prepare our hearts for communion. As we think about the way that God revives us, he does it in community, which is why when we take communion, we, are, we take it in community. And the communion uh, elements, they, they represent the body and blood of Christ. They represent um, what, what not only enters us, but what sustains us along this journey. It's the person of Christ resurrected for you. And the, the bread represents his body broken and the, the juice that we drink, it represents the blood poured out for you. And um, he set it up in a meal and he's like, I want you to do this to remember me and what I'm going to do for you and, and how I'm going to be that new person. I'm going to be that new treasure in your life. And, and as you do it, I want you to also be reminded that I'm coming again to fulfill all of my promises. And so as we come and prepare ourselves to take communion, I want you just to be thinking about where you might be on this particular journey and how today the communion moment, the elements, the remembrance and the spiritual nourishment of Jesus crucified and resurrected might not only help you to survive, but continue to flourish because he's that good. The tables are might be new to this church, might be new to Jesus. The tables are for those who've been disturbed by that news and are looking to Jesus as their hope and treasure. They're not perfect. They're not for those of you who get it all right all the time. The, 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 tables, the tables are for those who are messy and needy and are looking to Jesus over and over and over again. If you find yourself in a space where Jesus isn't your treasure or where Jesus has asked you to you know, make a move, and you're like, no, I'm not going to do that. You, you got a hard heart toward what Jesus wants to do in your life. Then I just invite you to stay where you are and, like, talk to the Lord about that. Let it, let it go by today and use today as, like, a marker where it's like, you know what? No more of that. God, change me because I can't change myself. But if you find yourself like me, just in that spot of, like, Jesus, I love the journey. It's really hard. I find myself beat up a lot of times. But you're what I need. And today we'd love to serve you that community. The way we'll do it is we have a table in the back and, and we have a, a few tables here. And we'd ask you to come and take the elements. There'll be a song that plays and you can think about where you are on that journey and what might be next for you and who you're passing that along to. And then uh, I'll come back up and, and we'll all take it together. The tables are open. On the night that he would be betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this do in remembrance of me, take it, eat. On that same night, uh, he took the cup. He poured it out and he said, drink this in remembrance of me. This is uh, for the forgiveness of your sins and take and drink. So I'm never sure whether to share this or not. I mean, sometimes I am, but I was thinking, like, like what we just did, he actually is spiritually nourished by the resurrected Jesus. He's a real person and there's a real power. And one of the ways I know that, we spoke about it this morning. There's two kids in my home um, that my wife and I uh, were just not equipped to handle on our own. They're, it's like overwhelming at times. It's just like crazy. I don't know how you said yes, <laughs> babe. But as we walk this journey of adoption through foster care, I have to tell you, like the resurrected Jesus is more than enough. 
and what we just did and being spiritually nourished by the real and living Jesus, as you go more and more on mission with him and for him, is something that becomes a reality every single day. Go get it. Go get it. Father, thank you that you meet us along the way and that you call us to more than we are because you're more than we can ever imagine. We want to worship you as we close our resurrected King. Fill us with your spirit and help us in all these things, Christ. Amen.